Hi, this is Mike Swanson of the Wall Street Window. I've got a real special guest. I've got David Morgan, who runs the website silver-investor.com and richesinresources.com. How you doing, David? I'm doing great, Mike. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for taking the time to talk to me, and uh, I'm real glad you're able to do it because I consider you to be the basically the world's foremost expert on silver investing. And uh, I've been following these precious metals markets now for years, and we've been declining in... Uh, silver and gold stocks basically since the fourth quarter of 2011 and I know once the decline ends we're gonna see another bull market that's just the nature of these things so to me it's real important to figure out when is a good time to buy these stocks and and silver and gold itself and and so forth so I was curious what's your take on what's going on in the market now well I think we're at or near a bottom in fact we may be just slightly past a bottom time will tell uh, bottom picking for me is more difficult than top picking. I've been more successful picking uh, the major tops all the way up, or I should say, intermediate tops. We haven't hit the major top yet, in my view. Uh, bottoms a little trickier. I did pick a bottom uh, back in May of last year uh, for the metals and, and for the mining equities. Basically, I said I think this is it, and that bottom held for quite a while. It recently, was breached to the downside. Uh, and I did a basis, uh, the mining indexes. You could use the XAU, the HUI, the GDX, GDXJ, any of them. Basically, we're showing the same type of formation and it looked like a bottom. And again, it looked like it, it did hold for quite some time. Uh, we sort of reached a new low. I think we've hit the, a new bottom in the, uh, in the mining equities. As far as the metals go, it's interesting as I did that update for my members, uh, you know, so long ago. It's been many months now. I said that in a bull market, the equities usually lead, and I'm calling the bottom here for the mining equities, and the metals should bottom slightly after, and they did. And what's interesting, Mike, is the bottom in the metals, particularly silver, is still the bottom. In other words, the bottom in the equities <clears throat> uh, has been breached, but the bottom for the metals has not been breached. The bottom uh, for silver was around the 26 level, a little bit higher than that, but basically the 26 level, and it stayed in that trading area for a while. So if you look at a chart and go back, you can see that the call so far on the metals is correct, but on the equities not. I don't know to the point. What we've been doing is asking people to go ahead and buy into this weakness, and we've been working as hard or harder than ever trying to find um, value in, uh, in the resource sector, and there's all kinds of value in the resource sector. There's many, many companies that are selling very much uh, at a bargain discount price, and yet uh, the sentiment is so bad that a lot of people own these shares, are giving up, and people that might want to be in the sector are waiting for a lower low, and it may not come. Yeah, I think you're you're right. At last year's in the summer in June it was real interesting because the way I interpreted the market was that the global stock market, just forget about the United States, but had been in a bear market, and we saw bottoms in in European markets, and every single market in Europe has gone up since then. The only one that hasn't is Cyprus, which uh, has made a new low here. But all the others have gone up. And I thought gold and commodities had made a major bottom too. And we're going to go into bull markets also. And it's like you said, you know, even though the gold stocks and the, and the silver stocks have made new lows recently, uh, the metals, silver and gold, have not. They, they've held their bottoms. So, uh, you know, if you look at that, then they haven't made new lows and you shouldn't get all scared but people are, are getting scared because these things have broke have the stocks have made new lows but like you said you know they've reached ridiculous valuations uh some of the gold companies such as newmont and barrack are paying four percent dividends which i've never seen before uh but i don't really know the situation though with the uh, junior mining stocks uh, uh is there a way to judge the valuations with them um, and, and tell if they're cheap or not. Well, it depends on the junior. Obviously, in an exploration company, there's no way to know. But on a, a producer or soon-to-be producer, yeah, you can use some metrics that you use on a larger company and get a pretty good idea of you know, what the true value of the company is. And those are the type of stocks that will appeal to us. You know, just for the record, we look at top-tier, mid-tier, and speculations. We're not like most newsletter writers in this uh in the gold sector or the silver sector, which most of them are pretty much looking at these small, itty-bitty, micro-cap companies. We look at a lot of them and don't like most of them. We do report on a few of them, and most of them would be considered, uh, you know, um, 
uh, blue chips compared to what some of these guys write about. But anyway, uh, yeah, you can find value there. Uh, but again, that's not what we spend. We probably spend more time there, uh, but we do, don't spend a lot of money there. So what we do with the model portfolio is big money goes into big, serious companies. Uh, medium money goes into mid-tier companies, and speculative money goes into speculative situations. We just put one out recently that had the highest grades of anything I've ever seen, Mike, and put it out and gave it to our readers, and we actually were able to gather a few new subscribers because I got a little um, excited about it, and still am. And the day that we uh, put out the report to everybody's benefit and told about this company with these super high grades, the price is actually off, about 6%. And, you know, I don't move stocks, really. In a real small company, any of us can, you can, you know, David Scarica, any of us that write in this industry can. Um, but it was sort of surprising because I knew there'd be some new buying, and it was off about 6%. Well, since that time, it's up about 30% in the oh, wow. market. Yeah. So, you know, and I don't want to pat myself on the back too hard because, you know, I'm too old and too wise to know it could fall off again. But it's a very value-oriented situation. I mean, the rock in this situation is just phenomenal. I mean, these are, this is a situation of ounces per ton. I mean, this is just a very, very rare, rare find for me uh, and for our members. But, uh, you know, moving on, I again think that um, it's testing everybody's metal, M-E-T-T-L-E. It's something you got to have conviction on. And I think that it's sold out. I think washed out. I think that uh, capitulation has been reached. I put out a new update for our members only on some of the stocks that we follow, some that we don't, using a mix of gold and silver companies and showing what the volume looks like and what these stocks chart patterns look like. And again, I'm never sure, but it certainly is indicating that we've probably hit the bottom. And now would be a good time to either add or not. And again, going back and trying to stay consistent because, you know, my paid members as well as people that never, you know, buy our subscription services, uh, you know, listen to these interviews, and I want to remain consistent in all levels. We've been basically been buying all along. I mean, we've been finding these uh, value situations and, and reasserting some of the ones that um, we've held for a long time, such as Silver Wheat, for example. Silver was up, I think, 12% last year. Silver Wheat was up 22% over the year. So, you know, there are instances where the mining equities have outperformed the metal, but that's the exception, not the rule. I readily admit that. Uh, the mining equities are such a discount. It's it's almost mouth-watering if you have the conviction to stay in this market or have any capital available now. Well, why do you think they've gotten so cheap? Uh, do you got any idea? Yeah, I've, I've got an opinion. I mean, I wish I could prove some of this right. stuff. One is the hedge fund community's favorite trade seems to be to be long the metal and short the equities. Uh, that's one. The other, I think, is more philosophical, but it's one that uh, goes again to the, the managed money community, whether it's a hedge fund, a pension fund, a money manager, uh, or that type of situation. These people were restricted from buying anything but equities for a long, long time, or still are, in fact, excuse me, let me repeat that. A lot of these people that manage money can only buy equities. But it wasn't until the last you know decade or so where these commodities have been turned into securities. So you can buy silver by buying the SLV, for example, or you can buy gold by buying the GLD. So this has taken a lot of money. I mean, because this is management, this is big money, this is a large pool of capital that can go into gold and not into a gold mining company. So if you go back like two decades, that amount of pent-up demand for gold could only go into gold equities, not into an ETF. So they got taken a lot of money that would normally go into the mining sector out of the mining sector. There's less risk for a money manager. If he has a ETF that's only gold, it's going to fall the price of gold. He doesn't have to worry about you know, a labor strike or a, a washout in the mine or a nationalization issue or any of these things that surround the mining industry. So I think that's really a big part of it. And again, the other part of it is that it's basically up to the public uh, to be in the mining sector right now, the big money, not that there isn't, you know, capital formation from large, you know, equity firms. And, you know, if you look at the mutual funds and some of the, you know, John Hathaways, for example, are out there and are still in the sector. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. What I'm saying is that the money that does exist in these large ETFs would have been in the mining area uh, in years past. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I, I 
it, I'm just thinking while you're talking, it'd be interesting to do a study. I don't know if anyone's done it, but just look at the G, once the GLD started trading, see, you know, if that's the time when the stock started to lag more or less. Uh, it may be. I mean, it'd be interesting to, to check that. What it, see if you can measure the impact that it has and prove what you're saying because it, it does make a lot of sense. I mean, I can imagine like if someone says, "Well, you should put 10 percent of your portfolio in gold," and well, there's an easy way to do it. You know, buy GLD instead of the stocks. So, but I think so, I think like, the the stocks are so cheap that at some point they're going to really take off and surprise everybody. <laughs> you know. Um, just wait. Well, I, I actually, I mean, I agree with that. I, I think that uh, that the gold stocks really are acting more like gold. And let me explain that. If you go back and look at the research, and this is easily provable if you do any, you know, googling on the subject. But gold is the most negatively correlated asset to the stock market. So, stock market up, gold down; gold up, stock market down. But yet, in in the last, I don't know, couple of years or so. Basically, it's the gold stocks and silver stocks have been the most negatively correlated asset to the yeah. stock market. You see the S and P, you know, and the DJI making new highs in nominal terms. I have to add, and these uh, mining equities are making, you know, not ultimate lows because the lows were back in the early 2000s, but I mean recent lows in the last few years, and it's it's just amazing. So. Um, when this turns around, and again, I think it could be very soon, I think you're going to see um, a very dramatic move in these mills. Not initially, maybe. It takes time to build a base, but we'll see. I mean, these, these are very small uh, companies for the most part. I mean, there are billion-dollar companies in the mining sector, of course, but there's a lot of, you know, mid-tiers that are barely a billion-dollar or you know, 500 million, which sounds like a lot of money for an individual, but for a company base, it's really not much of a market cap. So you're going to see any new money coming into these in a big way. And the last thing is, uh, that I'll add is that there will be the momentum players. I mean, there's so many software programs out there now and so many people that basically do what their computer tells them to do. That once these kind of equities, and it's any equity really, starts to move, it comes on a radar screen of all of these, um, I'll call them stock market uh, traders, and they'll say, oh my God, Newmont just made a, you know, X percent gain today on a huge volume, it's a breakup, buy it, and that will add to it. So there's this kind of uh, follow the leader type of mentality into whatever sector is moving at the time. Uh, if you couple that with some kind of a currency problem that we're, you know, always in the midst of, I mean, there's, you know, we don't have to visit the Cypress thing, but there's all kinds of things going on in the global economy that, that absolutely demands anyone paying attention to be in exposed to the precious metals at some level. Well, before we wrap up, I want to ask you one thing real quick, I, and I don't know if, if the question even means anything or, or what, but, you know, I look at the charts of these stocks, and if you look at the silver, the big cap silver stocks, like Silver Wheat and Pan American Silver and so forth, uh, Hecla, uh, they seem to have better charts than the the gold stocks, they seem to be performing better on a relative ba uh, basis over the past couple of weeks. It makes me wonder, you know, if they once things these the, the miners turn around, if the silver stocks aren't going to outperform the gold stocks. Wonder if you wonder if, if that's if you think that's the case. Well, it is. Uh, again, if you do enough research, you can prove it. It's just not my opinion. I'll state it as opinion, yeah. but. First of all, to find a true silver stock is a rare, rare thing. Mm. I'm not saying silver is rarer than gold, but what I am saying is that most silver is mined as a byproduct. So your RTZs, your BHPs, your huge conglomerates mine a great deal of silver, but to the bottom line, it has hardly any effect whatsoever. Uh, but yet they produce a lot because of all their copper, lead, and zinc mining. So to find an, an equity that's you know, very leveraged to silver, like say First Majestic, that's about 90%, which is about the highest one out there, uh, is a rare event. There aren't many, there's no such thing as a pure silver mine, and to be close to a pure silver mine is rare. So that's one. The other thing is silver, uh, silver has a leverage factor that's even greater than gold because it's a smaller market. So for example, Mike, at the top of the market last time, a good, powerful, strong company like a Newmont as an example, 
uh, would have a PE at the top of like 35 to 1, and a good strong silver company would have like a 50 to 1 PE. Wow. So I'm, I'm trying to compare apples to apples. I'm not, gold and silver are different, but they are precious metals. So at the top of the market, our multiple, our market cap structure was uh, higher for silver stock than a gold stock. And what that means is that people are willing to spend more, or pay more, or pay out for a silver equity than they are a gold equity. And again, that makes sense because there aren't very many of them. And silver sort of has this, and I like to say it, but it's true, uh, and I've said it before, it sort of has more of a greed factor to it than gold, just against my opinion. But a lot of the little guys that uh, come in late into the market say, oh my goodness, you know, gold's at 3,000. Darn, I wish I would have got in. My wife would have let me, or whatever their excuse is. And they see silver, well, it's over silver, it's still over 100 bucks. I'm going to get in. And they'll jump in. And then, of course, they'll push the price even higher because buying pressure, of course, moves anything up. So, you know, and one of my jobs will be to try and, um, you know, get out near the top. And, you know, that I think is years off. I think we're looking probably 2016 or so. I think we're three or four years out for that. But nonetheless, I think, again, that we're near bottom here. And um, it's something that I'm glad you're doing this interview. It's something that I think, you know, it's a service to people. I mean, this situation in Cyprus is pretty scary. I well, far back, basically, and just say, well, in the last month's Morgan report, I quoted Eric, uh, Eric Sprott uh, from the Silver Summit here last October saying that, you know, you might not think about having your money in the bank as a risky investment, but I think it is a risky investment, you know, if that's the paraphrase of this quote. And no longer did I write that in the last issue, and then here we have this thing with Cyprus where your money in the bank was basically even bit safe. And again, I'm not trying to, be, you know, push the fear card. I don't like pushing the fear card, but I do want to push the reality card. And that is the reality. You know, how safe is your money? Uh, you know, you got this money, gold and silver, I'm talking about the coins and the, you know, the metal itself. That's withstood every, you know, dictatorship, every change of, uh, you know, leader, every war, everything throughout recorded history. I mean, this is money that's never failed versus any paper currency on the planet that eventually has. And you tell me what the most conservative investment is. You know, I always get this in a really is a pet peeve of my mic where, oh, well, that's risky. I'm thinking to myself, is it? You know, silver's in the Bible uses money, and from that time till now, it's, it's had value. It's never failed. But all these other currencies have failed. So who's the most conservative here? Is it me? You know, people that are silver nuts or gold nuts or precious metals heads or metals heads or whatever, you know, word you want to put on us. Or is it you people out there that are paper bugs that think that, you know, the government knows, knows best? Uh, you know, I don't know. I've been uh, so steady in this subject for so long that uh, maybe I'm starting to sound like a cranky old man. But, you know, the reality is that these metals haven't failed. And obviously this uh, government fiat system always has had problems. Well, you just used a word I've never heard before, and I'm going to try to remember it because it's great. Paper bugs. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> it's true. Uh, well, uh, as we wrap up, could you tell everyone uh, what you provide you know, or where to go for more information? You bet. Uh, do a lot for free. If you just go to silver-investor.com and get our free email list. Uh, it's a very strong list, and it's about a once-a-week mailing, sometimes we mail during the week. The Saturday issue is basically a summary of all the interviews we do during the week. And then there's a YouTube channel, Silver Guru, and there's a Twitter feed that's Silver Guru 22. All that's for free. If you're really serious about this market and want to learn more about uh, money, metals, and mining, you can try the Morgan Report. There's a six-month subscription that's pretty reasonably priced and a couple upgraded services that you can uh, look at on the website. Uh, on top of that, we have a new site. It's called Riches in Resources. That's richesinresources.com, all one word. This is from some analysts that work with me. And basically, this is uh, an area where you can just go and buy a report. So, for example, let's say you're interested in new gold. You could buy the report on new gold or silver wheat, and you could buy a report. And these are standalone reports. These are basically objective analysis. My opinion isn't in there. This is just um, a report. On a company, so let's say that you're thinking of buying uh, uh, Alexa Resources, for example. I mean, for $49, you can buy this report, read an objective analysis of it, and make a determination whether you want to buy it. Or perhaps you already own that company or thinking about should you hold it or should you sell it. So this is something that I've been kind of 
toying with for quite some time and uh, again cut some of my uh, analytical help off on it. It hasn't gotten much publicity yet, Mike, so thank you for letting me talk about it. But I thought this is something, again, that's been asked for. It's like, well, I'd like to just buy a report. So, you know, of course, we can't get them all, but there is a box on the website that you could say, hey, how about XYZ Mining? I'll just let everybody know, you know, XYZ Mining is some startup exploration company with a small micro cap are probably not going to be able to do a report on that because there really isn't any meat. There isn't any real known facts that we can use to do a good report on it. But anything that you probably heard on, like, King World News or... Uh, many of the other uh, commentaries out there on the gold and silver uh, equities or gold and silver itself, those type of situations, you probably find a lot of those on this website. Well, I'm going to go check it out right now and dig around and see, see what I'm going to take a look at more. Well, thanks for taking the time to talk to me and everyone else and definitely do a, another interview in the future. Thank you, Mike. My pleasure.